Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon today is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And today we're going to continue to build on last week's lesson from Scripture that there is one correct body of doctrine, that it can be known by man, and that false teaching uh, must be rebuked uh, and, in fact, avoided. As we get into... Daniel chapter 7, I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the worship service today. The world has some pretty strange views about Jesus, and we have to be careful because we're only human, we're broken, the old Adam in us wants to deny God's truth, or at the very least that it can be known by man, and therefore becomes increasingly difficult for us to stay in touch with the truths about Jesus unless we're constantly in his word. So what the world around us is saying, that noise, can kind of get in our head and mess with the truth that's planted there by God's spirit through the word. Here are some of the things they say about Jesus. Many of them, for example, prefer Jesus, as I said, to be a toothless wonder in the manger, a fluffy God who gives you warm fuzzies, who just winks at your transgressions, but basically affirms who you are, who you want to be. Others want Jesus to be just a philosopher, just one more voice up there on a dusty bookshelf with the other philosophers that they ignore. Somebody of virtue, certainly, somebody who shows us how to live a good life, but to have any real authority over us as God the Son? Nah, that can't be it. The Bible speaks of Jesus in very distinct ways and lays out for us exactly who he is, and that's good news. We need to hear this, we need to know this, because our salvation is on the line, and if Jesus is anyone else other than who Scripture says we're not saved. That's a big, big deal. So let's get into the text, Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, and take a look at what we have here. Now this is Daniel writing about 600 years or so before Jesus. I saw, that's Daniel, I, Daniel, saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This son of man, this is a messianic prophecy. This is pointing forward to the one who would come uh, to pay for the sins of the whole world. And he's a son of man. But he's a very special kind of son of man. That term son of man means obviously this is a human being. But look, he's brought to the ancient of days and presented before him. This is highly unusual. This doesn't happen in Scripture. Let's go to the next verse. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Again, highly unusual speech to address to somebody who's merely a human being, just a son of man. Uh, this passage tells us definitively that this son of man is somebody who's not just human, but somebody who's sharing the very glory of the Lord. That's huge because Scripture tells us that God will share his glory with nobody. Okay? So if in fact, and we'll show you a couple of passages about that in just a second, but if in fact that's the case, and of course it is, Scripture says so, then this Son of Man can be no one else other than God in the flesh. Okay? And that's who has the dominion, and all nations shall serve him. Now, let's talk about that Son of Man phrase. It appears 94 times in Ezekiel. It appears 86 times in the New Testament. 82 of those 86 times, uh, this is Jesus speaking of himself calling himself in the four Gospels the Son of Man. Now, when it's used in Ezekiel 94 times, this is God talking to the prophet, identifying him as a part of his creation, okay? dealing with him in his humanity. When Jesus uses it in the four Gospels, he is identifying himself as the Son of Man from Daniel 7, who is both God and man, it's a very humble way of referring to himself. He's connecting with us and showing us his love. He loves us so much that he enfleshed himself, became incarnate. That's what incarnate means, in the flesh. Enfleshed himself 
and came here to suffer and to die, pay for our sins. Now let's go to Isaiah and look at the glory thing that I was talking about earlier. Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 48, it appears twice in Isaiah uh, up there. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. In Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it, for how should my name be profane? My glory I will not give to another. Twice in scripture, God says, I will not give my glory to another. This puts kind of the exclamation point on the statement that in Daniel chapter 7, the son of man mentioned there, the human being mentioned there, who receives the glory of the Father can be none other than God in the flesh. Has to be. God doesn't speak against himself. Scripture doesn't speak against itself. So these things... Uh, can only mean one thing. The Son of Man is God the Son. Now, let's look at some more passages. As we go through this, we're going to look at three sections of Scripture. Okay? First, we're going to look at Old Testament passages that prophesy that the Messiah who was to come would be God and man. Secondly, we're going to go to Jesus' own companions. And we're going to look in Scripture okay, to apostles, disciples, people you know, who wrote about who Jesus was. Then, in the third section of this sermon, we're going to go to Jesus' own words. Okay? And we're going to find a, put, you know, put a lid, put a cap on this thing and nail it down. Who was Jesus? He was God and man. But first, we need to know why we needed a Savior to start with. And we begin there in Genesis 3, 7, uh, 3.15. Genesis 3.15. Now, right before this, something huge has happened. Adam and Eve were created. They were told by God in relationship with him... Don't eat that fruit, don't touch that tree, or surely you will die. God is the author of life, and separating from life obviously means you get death, right? And they did it anyway. That's the point. You know, particularly with regard to Adam, to whom the command was first given. He wanted to be God in God's place, ate the fruit, broke relationship, and as a result, sin and death came into the world and through Adam to all of us. So the penalty is death. What's huge about this is that while God is just, cannot tolerate sin, is pure, is holy, so while he's just, and while he had every right to destroy creation and start over, or just destroy it and not start over, while he had every right, he didn't do that. Instead, he proclaims something else, and this is to the serpent in 315, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. There's already right there, there's a mercy word, offspring. God is saying, yes, you've broken relationship with me, and yes, you've brought sin and death into the world, and yes, you've placed yourself in a position where you shall die, you shall surely die. However, mankind will continue. You will have offspring. It's a word of mercy. You'll have offspring. He shall bruise your head, he's saying to the serpent, that ancient snake, the devil. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, indicating the kind of battle uh, that they would ultimately have. So this one who's the offspring of woman will bruise or will defeat Satan, sin, and death, even while Satan strikes back okay, at him. So now we're looking for a Messiah. Okay? Now, I want to talk about the consequences of the act in the Garden of Eden. Then we're going to come right back and wrap back to this. But first, Romans 3.10. This is the result of what Adam did. Romans 3.10, as it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. Okay? Because of what Adam did, all of us who come from him are automatically conceived and born broken and sinful. The Augsburg Confession calls it a disease upon our nature. We have original sin. It is impossible for natural man apart from God to love him, to please him, to want to know more about him, etc., etc., etc. Okay, Romans 3.10. Uh, lest we think this is a one-time occurrence, let's look at Psalm 14.3. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no, uh, none who does good, not even one. There's nobody good. Psalm 53, verse 3. 
Same thing. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Now, what's the result of all of this? The result of the fact that there is no one good, that all people sin, that sin is a part of our nature, is this. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins shall die. That first sentence. The soul who sins shall die. Now, this is important. We really need to grab onto this and understand How serious sin is. The soul who sins shall die. Okay. Well, pastor, I'm pretty good. I hear this all the time from unchurch people. If I ask somebody, where do you go to church? Part of a conversation. Well, I don't go anywhere, but I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Let's look at James 2.10 for an answer to pretty good. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So you see, back there sometime in our past, each and every one of us, at a time we probably can't even remember, we sinned. But oh wait, even before that, we were conceived in sin, broken, original sin, which means we're accountable for all of the law. Pretty good doesn't count. There's no such thing as pretty good. Okay? So we're accountable for all of the law. And we just saw in Ezekiel, that the soul who sins is the one that dies, which means that applies to each and every one of us. This is the seriousness of sin. The penalty is death. For which sins? For all sins. Do you mean even the little? Well, no. There's no little sin. All sin breaks relationship with God, and therefore we're accountable for the whole law, even breaking one little, if there was one little part of it. So what do we do? This wraps us back around to Genesis 3.15 and the Proto-Evangelium. The Proto-Evangelium. Latin word, it means first gospel. That's what Genesis 3.15 is. It's the first gospel. It's the first word of mercy. It immediately follows the first sin that introduced sin and death into the world. The first gospel is a declaration of mercy. I will send a savior. That's what God declares in Genesis 3.15. That offspring of woman will crush Satan. Will defeat sin and death. And he'll do it for you. And that is incredible and awesome, very good news. So let's talk about who that Savior is. Daniel 7 already told us something really, really, really important. He's a son of man. Offspring of woman, a human being, but not just a human being, but somebody who has the very glory of God. But what if that's the only place? Well, it's not. Here are some other places in Scripture that talk about that Messiah being God and man. Let's go to Psalm 2, verse 7. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The writer of Hebrews will quote this and apply it directly to Jesus. He'll say, for To whom else did the Lord say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So the one to come, the Messiah, the one who's going to crush the devil and rescue us from sin and death is someone that is going to be the actual son of God. That's not a euphemism. That's not a manner of speech. He will be the literal son of God and son of man. God and man in the flesh. Psalm 110, verse 1, this is David writing. A psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now Jesus will quote this later. And he'll say to the Jewish leaders, he'll say, if David is writing this, who's he calling his Lord? It's a rhetorical question. Jesus is that Lord. Jesus isn't just the prophet who showed up on the scene announcing mercy and so forth, but is the pre-existent Son of God, eternal, co-eternal with the Father, of the same substance as the Father. He is God who has come in the flesh. Isaiah 9, 6 talks about this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is a great Christmas text, you know, this always comes up sooner or later. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This child to be born, this offspring of woman, is Mighty God. That's awesome good news. And Isaiah also uh, pulls this together. uh, Chapter 7, verse 14. (laughs) Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now we know that the name of Jesus from the Greek, you know, Jesus, uh, Yeshua in uh, Hebrew, means Yahweh saves. So the Lord is, in fact, with us. He's God in the flesh. Matthew, in the first chapter of Matthew, verse 23, quotes this. Behold, the virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Matthew applies this to Jesus. Okay. So here, here we go. Here's the summary from the Old Testament. Not only are we broken and sinful, not only are we destined to die because of our sin, not only did God promise in his mercy to save us, but he promised to send a Messiah who is God and man. Now he's identified by Matthew as Jesus Christ. Jesus is God and man. Not just a warm, fuzzy guru. Not just justification for me being pretty good. But he's God in the flesh for the forgiveness of our sins, and that's awesome good news. But frankly, there's more Bible than just the Old Testament. Oh, sure, the Old Testament, what we've seen so far is plenty, but there's more Bible. And since there's more, we want to see that more speaking about Jesus in these terms. So here it comes. Jesus' own followers, what do they say about his divinity? Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Boom. There it is. This is Paul saying, point blank, Jesus is equal to God. He is God. He's God in the flesh. Let's continue, verse 7. But made himself nothing, so he humiliated himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So the one who is God took on flesh, took on the likeness of men. He's God in the flesh. This is who Jesus is. Next verse. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And here we have the two main works that Jesus did as our Savior first. First. He was obedient to the point of death. Now, he's our substitute. Okay? That's what our Savior is. He's our substitute. And this obedience, he performed this on behalf of you and I. We can't do it. In some way, every day we fall short, we sin. We can't, we can't do it. But he could. He's God in the flesh. He's without sin. He can perfectly obey, and he did it in our place. So now, by grace through faith, his righteousness is imputed to us. It's given to us. We're not just pretty good. God declares us righteous for Christ's sake. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's something we can't do on our own. Now, the second work of Christ is after the comma. Even death on a cross. He is the propitiation for our sin. Propitiation means payment. Okay, theologians are paid by the syllable. We had proto-evangelium earlier. Now we have propitiation. We can talk about incarnation in the flesh. Paid by the syllable. That's why sermons are so long. Don't worry, this one won't be a bit over 45 minutes. No problem. See the two works of Christ again? Obedient in our place, payment in our place. That's it. That's everything that we need. Everything we need is Jesus. That's why this stuff, this is huge. This is awesome good news. Now, the New Testament will go on to give even more witness to the divinity of Jesus, God in the flesh. Acts 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, here we go, which he obtained with his blood. Did you see that? His. Okay. The pronoun refers back to the preceding noun, God. God obtained the church with his blood. That's Jesus. Obtained with his own blood. God did that. That's awesome. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's who Jesus is. 
The image of God. Not image like a shadowy reflection in a mirror, but the image of God. You want to see God? Look at Jesus. That's how he's revealed himself. Look at Jesus. The glory of Christ. Again, going back to the glory. Remember from Isaiah, God gives his glory to no other. Therefore, Christ must be God and man. Let's go to Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He being Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We have it again. The firstborn of all creation. Okay. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus is the spoken word of creation, the pre-existent Son of God, God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity, through whom, by whom, for whom all things were created and continue to have their being. Okay, next verse. And he is before all things. He's eternal. And in him all things hold together. This is the Jesus we have. This is Jesus for us. Incredible. Good news. Colossians 2.9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is not subordinate. He's not sort of God, kind of God, sum of God. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He is God. Okay. Titus 2.13 is point blank. Middle of the sentence. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bang. Right on the money. No confusion. Okay. Jesus Christ is God and Savior. Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Okay. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, God's own son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. It says it there again. Okay. Verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. That's awesome. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. And the exact print of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The radiance of the glory of God, that's Jesus. The radiance of the glory and the exact imprint of his nature. Now we go to the Gospel of John. If anybody knew Jesus on this earth, it certainly was John, the apostle, whom Jesus loved. We go to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's jump to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the spoken Word of creation. Through whom, by whom, for whom all things were created and continued to have their being. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have covered the Old Testament prophecies. Oh, certainly not all of them. There are plenty more. But we've covered some key Old Testament prophecies about the divinity of Jesus. Now we've heard from Jesus' own followers that they most certainly believed and knew that he is divine, that he is God in the flesh. But what about Jesus himself? You know, the big falsehood floating around out there is that, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Really? Actually, he did. It's all over the four Gospels. We're going to just look today at John, and we're not even going to look at every instance of this in John. There are three more Gospels after this, but we're going to give you a handful here. John 5, 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You see, Jesus' own enemies, in his day, hearing him face to face, they knew what he was claiming. They knew he was claiming to be God, and that's why they wanted to kill him. They knew he said he was God. Let's go to John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is the name of God Almighty. Yahweh, okay, that's Hebrew, it's a verb, it means I am. The name of God is a verb, I am. Jesus there calls himself Yahweh. Okay. Can't miss it. 
None of his enemies missed it. We can't miss it. It's there point blank. Jesus is God. Uh, let's go to John 10, 30 to 33. I and the Father are one. Can't miss it. It's right there. I and the Father are one. Next verse. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. See, they're not missing the point. They don't misunderstand what he's saying. They get it. It's clear. He's saying he's God, and they're bent out of shape. Next verse. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Okay. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Point blank. Point blank. They totally got it. He was proclaiming to be God in the flesh. John 14, 8 and 9. Poor Philip, one of the apostles. Poor, perfectly normal question. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Perfectly normal. Here's Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You know, Jesus kind of says to Philip, duh. You know, Philip wants to see the Father. Jesus says, oh, that's me. Been standing here, been walking around with you. That's me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 17, verse 5. This is part of Jesus, what they call the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying to the Father. He's not doing it because he needs to. He's doing it for the benefit of all those hearing him. As a part of the prayer, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This is Jesus praying this in front of everybody. Recorded in Scripture, divine inspired Scripture for posterity. Jesus is calling himself pre-existent, from before creation, eternal, sharing the glory with the Father. The Father who has already said way earlier in Isaiah, I don't share my glory with anyone else, meaning that Jesus can only be God. He's God in the flesh. Uh, John 20. In John 20, Thomas is having a little trouble here. We call him Doubting Thomas. That's not exactly correct. Actually, in the Greek, he's a disbelieving Thomas, refusing to believe. He says... Oh, you say, you know, to the apostles, you say that Jesus rose from the dead? No, 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 no. Unless I put my finger in the nail holes, unless I put my hand in his side, I am not going to believe, and Jesus shows up. Hey, Thomas, here are the nail holes. Here's my side. Thomas drops and says, my Lord and my God. Now, here Jesus has an opportunity to correct him if he's not God and say, oh, no, Thomas, don't say that. I'm not God. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says to Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, which means you and I. Which is awesome good news. He doesn't correct Thomas. Thomas is calling him God. He doesn't correct him. He accepts the worship because he's God. Okay. All right, uh, look, let's look at uh, Revelation. Now, this is Jesus after he's ascended into glory. John is receiving a vision of heaven. Here we have two verses uh, and they say basically the same thing, but it's interesting. In Revelation 1.8, uh, this section appears to be the Father, God Almighty, saying this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Then it's Jesus clearly speaking, identified in uh, chapter 22, verse 13, saying the same thing. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This is Jesus saying the Father's words, claiming to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Okay? And let's wrap up our verses with Revelation 14, 14. It's going to bring us back around to Daniel. This is that imagery of the Son of Man pulled forward now into John's vision. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. This is for the end-time harvest. The Son of Man is there with his crown. Okay. Right. Now, practical application. I showed you all of these verses and did all of this digging and brought all of this forward for your edification so that you can know, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt who Jesus really is. 
And my hope for all of us, me included, is that in the middle of this craziness of the Christmas season and the running around, uh, buying presents, and worrying about what we're receiving, uh, worrying about parties, and all of this busyness and activity that we go through, that in the midst of all this, that Jesus isn't lost in the shuffle because people, we are here to celebrate the birth of the one who is God and man. God incarnate in the flesh for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's awesome good news. I showed you earlier that, look, even one sin, one single sin deserves death. It's eternal separation from God. If that doesn't make you gulp, <laughs> I don't know what will. Right? The prospect of an eternity without God. But God fixed that. God provided a way when we had no way, when we, in, under no certain terms, we could not dig our way out. We had no way to pay God back. He provided the payment, and the payment was his son. God came in the flesh. That's what Christmas is about. God came in the flesh, and he suffered, and he died, and he paid for the sins of the whole world, so that by grace through faith in him, you're forgiven, you're saved, and you have eternal life. And consider his love for you. That even he, on the cross, after the unbelievable torture, you know, the whipping with the flagellum and the crown of thorns and the striking and the spitting and the everything, being nailed to that cross and being mocked on that cross, if you are the Son of God, come down from there. And he could. That's the thing. He could have come down. But then if he did, he wouldn't get you. And so he stayed. And so in their hate and their spite, they blasted away at him. And he suffered, and he bled, and he suffered, and he bled some three hours or more. And he died on that cross so he could come and get you. Sure, Christmas is coming, but you've already received the greatest gift of all. You have the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, not just a good idea, not just a guru, but the one and the only one who's God in the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. Please stand.